We're here today with Grace G. Sun Kim. Grace is the author of many books, including Invisible, Theology and the Experience of Asian American Women. The Englewood Review of Books listed it as one of the 12 important theology books of 2021. Grace was born in Korea, educated in Canada, and now teaches in the U.S. She is professor of theology at Earlham School of Religion in Richmond, Indiana. She's the author or editor of 20 different books, including Hope and Disarray, Intersectional Theology, and Planetary Solidarity. She is a co-editor for the series Asian Christianity in the Diaspora. Grace is an ordained Presbyterian Church USA minister and writes for Sojourners, Wabash Center, Baptist News Global, and Feminist Studies and Religion, and is published in Time, Huffington Post, Christian Century, U.S. Catholic Magazine, and The Nation. She is the host of the Ma Dong podcast, which uh, holds conversations on Christianity, religion, and culture, and is produced by the Christian Century. Grace will also be one of the featured speakers at our upcoming How to Write Dangerously online conference starting September 12th, which we're very much looking forward to. You can learn more about Grace at gracegsunkim.wordpress.com. So, Grace, thanks so much for joining us, and congratulations on all the amazing things that you've done. Oh, thank you so much, Brian. It's such a pleasure to be on your podcast. It's so exciting to have met you a few times in my, like, personally and physically. So it's a pleasure to be on today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing, isn't it? I mean, you know, so many of the folks that I collaborate with is predominantly in this kind of a forum as opposed to in person uh, (laughs) over the last couple of years. And uh, Uh But it's nice, you know, to be able to collaborate. You're in Indiana and I'm in uh, New Jersey. So it's like Mm -hmm. that we don't have to be in person together in order to do things together, which I just yeah. love. But, mm-hmm. yeah. So um, to get started, what else would you like to tell people besides the things that I mentioned? Oh, you mentioned enough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, for we have a family, work. right? Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. So uh, a husband who teaches at Kutztown University, he's a math professor, and then three kids. So the oldest um graduated from Hopkins a couple years ago, and he will start uh, med school at Yale next year. He deferred it one year. He's working in New York. And then my daughter, who will be going to going back to Cornell soon as a senior. And then my youngest is a second-year student at UPIT. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. That's fantastic. Right. <laughs> I have three well-educated children uh, coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking. Yeah, because I usually don't say too much about my immediate family. I do share a lot of pictures though on uh, internet, but then I always have to ask for their permission now. <laughs> <laughs> so not as frequently. But anyway, yeah. So that's my family here in the U.S. Things change, you know, as they get older, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, before we get into the new book, you know, you've written so many other books. I mean, would you like to tell folks a little bit about some of those? Sure. Uh, for I don't know why I have a little cough today. So do I. It's not a problem. <laughs> okay. So actually, I have a book right behind me, which uh, is the one that came out before Invisible. It's called Hope and Disarray. So if people are looking for books kind of to read, um, like reflective books, then this is a good book on um, climate change, racism, and... Um, sexism it, it's a kind of a devotional book for people to use either by themselves or in the church so i really um enjoyed writing this one and it's published by pilgrim press um and it, you know this came out just before invisible i think this was my 19th book mm. and um my first book is Grace of Sophia, which was published by Pilgrim Press. Mm. So that was my first one. And so uh, when this came out, it was just a nice book and until the new ones started coming out. But, you know, this, to me, it's, um, you know, I at the beginning when I was publishing uh, my books, they were so academic. Um, and some of them still are, but I do want to write more for the public. And so this one is important to me because they are more um, kind of theological reflection for the public and not an academic book, not a, like a textbook. So, um, and I hope to do more books like this. So I'm really um, happy with this Hope and Disarray so you can get it. 
And then the other one that's interesting behind me is um, keeping hope alive. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> when I was at the um, Wild Goose Festival and I saw you there, I did a book signing with um, Jim Wallace and he said, you're not Jesse Jackson. Why are you <laughs> signing this book? And I said, well, I'm the editor. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I edited that book and I'm really um it was such a thrill because it's such a uh, it's like a historical living book mm. uh, we included his two DNC speeches mm. um that was like a last minute insertion we weren't going to put that because we thought everybody can kind of get it online somewhere or find it but I'm really thrilled that we put that in and then it's got um, several of his sermons and then more of his speeches mm. so I'm really thrilled to have um, edited that book and it's selling well and you know it's also for the church and for the public so we're hoping that people will continue to get it to get a deeper insight into uh reverend jackson's life and sure sure yeah that was a thrill to do too it took a long time i'm telling you you know when the books come out sometimes they just come out and it looks like you just worked on it a few months but that was (laughs) many years of uh, working on that rewriting and editing his sermons and speeches so it took many many years Mm -hmm. one of the longest Mm -hmm. books yeah that i've kind of worked on well, now that I've been involved in the publishing industry for the last few years, I'm getting some insight into that that I didn't have before. Um, yeah. Because of the other book, so. Yeah, it is. Um, yeah, so I know many of your listeners are authors or want to publish books. Um, that's what you do. And it is torturous. Um, you know, there's a lot of good memes online that you can find, you know, the really bad first draft or the really bad hundredth draft. it's so horrible and it's embarrassing if you're working with someone to help you edit you know because it's not the finished product people only read the finished product and it looks good well hopefully there won't be any errors you know but there's always human error somewhere it's not a robot writing it or a robot editing uh, or copy editing so but you know it's it's a lot of work and um if you're not I'm going to push yourself. It can, it can be on your shelf or in your laptop now for decades before you start writing again. So I, I'm not saying that to discourage you, but that is the reality because there's no one coming to get you to say finish the book. <laughs> you know, it's got to come out of you. And, and so it's, it's a lot of work. And then, you know, finding the publisher, I know you hold those conferences too. That's a lot of work in itself too. So I think every step of the way, it's a lot of work and effort and just, you know, perseverance, (laughs) maybe one of the words, just perseverance and um, that you're not going to be hard on yourself. I think that's another thing, you know, because if you're too hard on yourself, you can just throw it out and then never come back to it. So I really encourage people to keep writing. <laughs> well, you're up to over 20 books. So you've 21. done quite a few times now. <laughs> 21. And then um, one book, um, an edited volume will be coming out next year with um, University of Edinburgh. Hmm. It's uh, volume seven of, um, I think it's called Glo- World Christianity or Christ. I'm so bad with titles. That's why I said from now on, it's going to be one word title. That's why the <laughs> invisible is one word because I can't remember the titles of my books, but that one it's, I don't, I forget, but it's co-edited uh, with um, Dr. Todd, uh, Todd Johnson. And um, oh, why am I so bad with <laughs> We email all the time. Um, yeah, I, I really apologize to oh, my editor. Okay. <laughs> no like, problem. Yeah, it, it's so bad. And, you know, we've been working on it for years, but it's a great volume. Volume seven, there have already been other volumes on world Christianity. So this will be on North America. Oh, the other um, co-editor is Dr. Ken Ross. Mm. I just, yeah. 
So um, it'll be coming out next year. It's a really big volume, many, many contributors. I don't know, over 600 pages. There's atlases, there's everything wow. you need to know about Christianity in North America. So mm -hmm. we're just working on the cover right now. And it takes a long time because there's so many um, statistics and, and a lot of appendixes. So it's a huge, enormous project. Wow. So, about that so that's coming out next year probably spring or the summertime wow so um let's get into the new book um yeah. uh, not quite the newest book but um in invisible we're going to talk about invisible mm -hmm. today theology and experience of asian american women what inspired you to write that book oh so you know i was talking to my eldest son a few months ago and telling him i'm working on X, Y, and Z, and I told him, usually something gets me really angry and then, <laughs> or upsets me, and then I'll write a blog or um, it may turn into a book. So this was a book within me for the last, I don't know, since I was in seminary. So maybe 20 or more years ago, 25, 26 years ago, um, something within me, because if you read the book, it's got a lot of personal stories and personal experiences. Um, I was hoping, you know, it didn't start out as a memoir, and it's not real memoir, but I had a memoir in mind, and then it turned um, into this book, Invisible, because I really wanted to share the um, Asian American uh, immigrant experience, Asian American experiences of racism and sexism, xenophobia, subordination, all those experiences. So it's something that I've been carrying around with me. Oh. And um, I found, you know, after all the academic books, although I think Fortress may think it's a little more academic than, it, than I want to perceive <laughs> it as. For me, I find it's kind of in between. It, it is really a book for the public. And uh, for those who are interested in Asian American um, history, theology, culture, um, religion. And, um, you know, it can be used as a textbook. I haven't used it. For me, it's so hard to use some of my books um, in my classes, but I'm getting more used to it. So I'm, um, like this fall, I'm going to be using intersectional uh, theology mm -hmm. co-written with Susan Shaw. So I'm going to integrate more of my books. So I'll, I may use Invisible in my uh, liberation theology class, but it is really in between because um, it has so much of my story in it. Um, I do that because whenever I teach theology, I say uh, theology is biography and biography is theology. So we understand God from our own personal experiences. So, you know, I, I wrote this book and then I was I became really ill two years ago. So I had taken a break for months. And then when I came back to it at the copy editing stage, I had actually forgotten that I wrote so much of my personal stories. In it. <laughs> and then I was having like almost a nervous breakdown because some of them were really personal. Um, and something I thought maybe I shouldn't um, like disclose to the whole world. And then so I was debating during the copy editing stage. And I thought if I delete few of these stories, I'm going to end up deleting more. And then I thought there'd be no book left. <laughs> so I ended up keeping every story. Wow. And I'm, I'm, a few of them I can't even read again because some of them are really heart-wrenching personal stories. Mm. I, I didn't think I would, I actually wrote it before I got ill, but somehow I, they were all in there. And, you know, but I think it's important to share. And, you know, even though the subtitle is Asian American, you know, it is really Asian American. I'm really hoping it's for, through my own story, that those who feel marginalized, those who feel invisible, those who feel um, uh, subordinated, subjugated, you know, there are a bunch of these categories of people and individuals, whether it be their um, sexuality, their identity, um, their occupation, their ability. There's so many ways that individuals and groups of people feel marginalized that those who come to read it, um, that it will be a source of hope and liberation. Because even though I write from my own experience, 
you know, I'm hoping that it will help those who have experienced uh, similar or in the same arena experiences. Because, you know, I read Native American books, uh, Latinx, uh, African American, and even though they are sharing their story, I come to understand myself from their experiences and their story too. So that's what I'm hoping. I hope it's not just, oh, it's an Asian American that I'm white and I won't read it. I'm hoping that everyone will get a chance to read it and um, learn from it and find hope and liberation from it. Mm, Yes, yes. So can you share with folks what a theology of visibility means? Yeah, so when I was writing the book, you know, I write a lot about... um, you know, my experiences of racism in society and um, sexism within the church and within my Asian American culture and the Asian culture. And everything felt so negative and so um, like there wasn't hope in the book. And I am much about hope. And that's why I wrote hope and disarray and keeping <laughs> hope alive. Because without hope, you know, the, what's the point of understanding all of our experiences of invisibility and marginalization? There is no point. So I thought, you know, it is so negative, the beginning part of the book. I thought I have to end in a good in a good note, in a hopeful note. So I struggled to finish the book um, because it was easy for me to write the beginning, you know, because we all need to know about racism and being called the other and and um, the perpetual foreigner experience of Asian Americans, the model minority experience of Asian Americans that I've always um, carried and experienced throughout my whole immigrant life. But the the theology of visibility that you um, asked me that I had to really dig and and search for because I, I realized, you know, I do teach liberation theology, those liberation theology, you know, there's a whole slew of them, you know, Latin American liberation theology, um, black uh, liberation theology, um, queer theology. There are, there's a whole slew of liberation theology and they weren't speaking to my particular context and experience. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, many people do ask, why is your book called Invisible? It's called Invisible because that is a common experience for Asian Americans. No Asian American has asked me why I called it Invisible, because mm-hmm. even without even saying the word, we understand it is this common experience. Um, the wider white community makes us invisible in so many, many ways. You know, I just recently participated in an AAPI rally in New York Mm. to get AAPI history into the New York State curriculum. Mm. You know, it's not taught in the U.S. and it's not taught in Canada. My kids grew up in Pennsylvania. They never learned about Asian American history. Mm. And we've been here a long time, but none of it is included in history. We are made invisible when we talk about racism here in the U.S. because we talk about it in black and white terms. So it's always against white people, against black people. And then so Asian Americans are always left out of this discussion and left out of this, you know, whenever I say I've experienced racism, many people will say, well, you're not black. So you didn't experience racism or that was not racism because you are Asian American. So in so many ways, we are made invisible. Uh, So it is this common experience, whether you be in the workforce or in school or in the church, we are made invisible. So it was very, very important for me then, how are we going to make us ourselves visible? Um, how how can we have a theology of visibility? So that's what I really struggled with. And um, I'm really happy with what I came up with. You know, part of theology is imagination. It is um, kind of using your imagination and, and being constructive and so forth. So I use some Asian uh, cultural terms and words 
to work towards a theology of visibility. And so, as I said earlier, it's not just Asian Americans who are marginalized and made invisible. I think trans, um, those who are of different um, sexuality or gender identity, um, ableism, people in so many ways are made invisible. We don't bring them into the table and have a discussion and have communion together. So I'm hoping that this book will help those who have also feel, have experienced invisibility um, and marginality and xenophobia, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, clearly with the pandemic, what we've been through since the early stage of it and the more recent, um, Racism against Asian Americans has been, I mean, I would say it got yeah. worse, right? Yes. I mean, yes. it's, and it's it highlighted and, and I mean, are you feeling that it's getting any better now or what, what, how do you see all of that? No, I think you see the problem with Asian American is, or what, what happens to Asian American is unless it's a huge tragedy, uh, news reporters don't really pick up on the Asian American hate crimes. Mm -hmm. There are a few Asian American reporters like Sifan Kim on ABC mm -hmm. News, uh, Channel New 7 York. New York. Yeah. Yeah. So if you follow him, he'll report as many as possible. But mainstream, MSNBC, CNN, unless it's a really atrocity, it, they don't really cover it. So hate crimes are happening all the time against Asian Americans. They target the more vulnerable, who are the elderly, who are the women. Uh, we are slashed with knives, uh, verbally attacked, called names, uh, you know, pushed in the subway. You know, people are dying, um, followed and stabbed and murdered. So these hate crimes continue to happen. And in some ways, we are made invisible because the main line, they don't like to report on all of these, but they are there. And um, during the pandemic, one of my friends, Dr. Russell Jung, started Stop AAPI um, hate kind of organization. You can Google it online where um, people can report mm. uh, what has happened to them and they're collecting data. He teaches at San Francisco State University and he's a sociologist. So he's very interested in what is happening to the AAPI community. So he started that during the pandemic. But I must say that this AAPI hate crime has been part of our American history. It just, it's not well documented or, or taught. You know, when we think about lynching, you know, the first thing is African-Americans. One of the large, lin largest lynching in American history happened in LA against Chinese. Mm. Um, 17 to 21 were lynched. That's the largest lynching that happened at one time. And so, but many sure people do don't know about it. We just think of lynching that happened to African-Americans, but it has happened to different groups. But the largest uh, recorded in history is um, happened in, in, in Chinatown um, in LA. Mm -hmm. And that was for no reason. Um, just a mob, just a riot happened and they were lynched. And so these hate crimes have happened, you know, when I think about, and I include some of these in my book, Invisible, 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act. When we think about Exclusion Act, we think of, oh, Trump, he was crazy and he did the Muslim, uh, he, he banned Muslims. And we think that was the only and the first ban of any kind of group of people. But it was 1882, Congress had passed the Chinese yeah. Exclusion Act. Everybody was afraid of Chinese. They thought, you know, right now during the pandemic, we're blaming, um, you know, Asians for bringing it and spreading it. it. You know, we're the guilty ones. But we, if you look at American history, during other pandemics and other disease times, always Asian Americans were blamed. And before the Chinese Exclusion Act, people were afraid that the Chinese were bringing um, disease, they were taking our jobs, um, there are bad people, et cetera, et cetera. So that was supposed to be in place for 10 years, but it lasted till um, 
a long time and, and until 1943. So during that time, no Chinese were allowed to come in. It was very hard for Chinese to leave to visit family. They had to carry papers around and there were so many other restrictions upon the Chinese. But then the other problem was Japanese, Korean and some other uh, we were kind of all included because yeah. every, the white people, we all look the same. Yeah. So, you know, and when we think about voting rights, uh, we always think about African-American voting rights, but Asian Americans never got to vote until 1943. Hmm. That's a very recent history. And that wasn't all Asian Americans. It was first the Chinese were allowed to vote and then 1946 Japanese and then slowly everyone else. Hmm. But, you know, this is, so the, during the pandemic, <laughs> You know, we want to fight the Asian crimes, um, the crimes committed against the AAPI community, but the crimes have been there throughout our whole history here in North America. Mm. So I think that needs to be taught in schools and also the good things, because we don't want to say we're, you know, all, only bad things. You know, we have contributed greatly to society and those things need to be taught too. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So one thing I'm kind of curious about, and you look both in Canada and the United States, and it, I mean, it, from my perception at least, is that percentage-wise, there are more Asian Americans in Canada than there are in the U.S. Um, I'm not positive that. Do you know if that's the case? Um, um, I don't know the latest statistics. I think here it's just over 6% of the American population is Asian American, but that is growing. We know that the white right. population is shrinking. I don't know what the latest stats in Canada may be, but it may be higher than that. Um, they, you know, they say the largest a uh, group of Chinese living outside of China is Toronto. They say one out of 10 uh, living in Toronto is of Chinese descent. So there is yeah, a Vancouver large- also, you know, it's got a large, you know, Asian population too. Where? Yeah, Vancouver. Yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. No, they do maybe have a larger um, um, Asian American community, but the racism is still there. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're 6%, 20%, um, you know, racism is systemic and it's embedded in this white culture and it's really, really difficult to fight it, but we must fight it. We must call it sin as Christians um, and it, it, it should not belong in our churches, in our faith communities and in our society. So we need to fight this and it's racism against all people of color. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we think of it as black and white, but we need to be aware that racism is against Native Americans, Latinx, Asian American, um, and the African American community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, what kind of steps can we take? I mean, you know, I, I know in, in my own case, I try to make sure at my conferences I have a good rep- representation from various groups. Um, same thing with the interviews that I do and things like that. But, you know, what else can those of us who are white Americans do? Well, when it comes to hate crime, um, I think we cannot be silent. So amplify it. If you see it happening right in front of you, you should do something about it. There have been many verbal attacks many physical attacks and everybody walks by. It's like the Good Samaritan story. You know, you just kind of walk by because everybody's busy. They're on their way to work and and an appointment or something. But I think the interception and and to stop these from happening is very, very important. I think being in solidarity uh, with the AAPI community is very important. Um, calling out racism and fighting racism in whatever capacity that you can. You know, the thing, the problem with racism, because it's so embedded, uh, you know, it's part of our churches too. And so this awareness of how racism is being played out, um, I think more needs to be done in within faith communities. And I'm thankful for you to make it more diverse and amplifying um, um, diverse voices, women and people of color. I think those are all important. But to really uh, fight racism, um, it's a daily bis- it's a d- on a daily basis. That is very, very important. Mm-hmm. So I think being in solidarity, you know, 
traditionally there is a lot of tension between Asian Americans and African Americans. And that is this part of this racism that is happening because, um, you know, in the 1960s, white sociologists came up with the term model minority and they said, oh, Asian Americans are model minority. So African Americans, please stop complaining. If you just work hard enough, then you will become rich and go to the top schools. You will have great jobs. You will live so fantastic, the American dream. And then they send that to Native Americans and um, the Hispanic Latinx community. But the thing is, we Asian Americans are not all rich. We don't all make it to the top schools. We're not doing well. You can just go to Flushing and you find people living in poverty. And in other places around the U.S., we're not doing well, but they decided the white dominant culture decided to do this and keep saying this against Asian Americans. And what it does is it only pits us against other people of color. So this is kind of racism being played out and this white dominant culture um, kind of pitting us against each other. And so we people of color need to be in solidarity, not allow racism to pit us against one another, we need to be in solidarity and work together to fight racism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, you recently spoke a few different times at the Wild Goose Festival. Can you talk about what that uh, experience was like for you? Um, I, I didn't know, that was my first Wild Goose and I didn't know what I was getting into. <laughs> <laughs> But I really, really enjoyed it thoroughly. Like I'm not, I grew up as a very outdoorsy girl, but as I, I got older, I'm really sensitive. My skin is very sensitive. I get itchy. The sun is not good and the bugs love me. So I don't go outdoors much. You'll, so you'll rarely see me, you know, taking a hike somewhere or on the beach uh, because then it just ruins my whole body. But so I was really scared about that. But, um, you know, besides that, I haven't been like outdoors like that in, in, in a very long time, many decades. And I haven't been in a context like that in a long time. And I really, uh, it reminded me how much I enjoyed that and meeting people. And because I was a newcomer, I thought, you know, I don't know how people are going to receive my work and my books, but the book sold well and people were so thankful and you know they emailed on social media so i was really really um happy about the event and when i came back um i actually live in pennsylvania so i i preach a lot here and you know i'm ordained presbyterian and you know our churches are shrinking our resources are depleted you know the the Presbyterian Church um, near where I live, they had a couple of camp sites or retreat centers. I think they closed down or they gave them away to some other organization. Something happened. I'm not sh too, um, too sure. So I thought the Wild Goose is a fantastic event for those small churches mm. because uh, it's already all set up. You just have to pay the money and go with and experience it and hear speakers and listen to sermons and the band and the workshops and because for and it's not just the presbyterian church other denominations their oh, resources yeah, are yeah are depleting so i actually think it's a great opportunity for those churches that can't hold a retreat or a camp or something during the summer That's a really they really good idea. want to yeah. yeah they really want to but they can't so rather than spending tons of money and trying to organize it, they can just all go down as a church. I thought that would be fantastic. And I'm hoping that more uh, diversity, like more people of color, like there were only a handful of Asians um, yeah. present. And the ones that were, were basically the speakers. <laughs> so I'm hoping that um, because the Asian American community can really um, benefit from that too. And to be able to work together and worship together and learn from one another, I think it's just a fantastic opportunity. So I felt really honored to be one of the preachers and speakers there. Yeah, you were, the reception to you was really positive, I, I felt, from what I could see. 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so I was really because I was so worried about how are they because I'm thinking nobody has heard of me <laughs> in that context. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, as I mentioned in the intro, you're going to be presenting at our upcoming online conference um, in September called How to Write Dangerously. Um, would you like to give folks a short preview of what you're going to be talking about then? Oh, yeah, sure. I hope people will come. And I'm going to do one of those live Q&As, I think, that yes. we set up. Yes. So I would love for people to come into my live Q&A. And, you know, the theme is how to write dangerously. And I think when I was doing uh, Invisible, I think part of that was writing dangerously. Yes. Um, sharing my story, even though uh, it's very personal. I think that uh, to write from the heart, from within your heart, is writing dangerously. But I think when you do that, in one sense, it will help a lot of people because you will realize that it's not just your story. Your story just becomes a window for readers and others to enter their own stories and their life. And it will eventually help and maybe be prophetic. So I'm hoping, I'm still putting it together, but mm -hmm. that's the gist of it. And so I hope people do come to How to Write Dangerously and to the live q and I look forward to that. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it too. I mean, I think it's really an outstanding group of uh, speakers. And, um, oh, thank you. Uh, I'm just so looking forward to listening what what everyone has to say so yeah. um so um looking forward i uh, do you have any future books that you're able to talk about yet or not um that not that i can talk about oh, oh, okay um <laughs> global christianity volume seven right 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 i can talk about but not the other ones <laughs> okay okay well um, we'll stay tuned. I mean, let us yeah, know. Yeah, you have to stay tuned because my problem is that I feel like if I talk about it, I'm going to jinx myself. So <laughs> I don't talk about it <laughs> until it's about to come out. Sure. <laughs> then, but you can have me back when it, when it does come out. It's going to well, be many more years. But that Global Christianity Volume 7 on North America will be out next year. So you okay, can well, we'll, we'll, we'll do an interview on that then. Um, yeah. <laughs> And I know since you've written so many books in the past, I'm sure you're going to be writing plenty more. So we'll have uh, future opportunities to uh, cover those. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Brian, for inviting me. Yeah, Grace, thanks so much for uh, all the work that you've done. It's really been a pleasure to get to know you, and I really look forward to all of our future collaboration. Yeah, me too. Thank you. And thank you that you're one of the sponsors on my podcast, Madang, and hopefully we can do more. And so it's a thrill to collaborate with you. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, well, same here. Thank you.